Hello, hello gang, welcome back to my YouTube channel, uh, me, hi, Yinka Bikini. We are here with a brand new true crime story for you to get stuck into, but of course, bite size edition. If you are new here, every week I stick 10 minutes on the clock and I tell you as much as is possible about a case. Now, a few people have asked me to make these episodes longer and all that sort of stuff, but the reason why they are 10 minute bite size true crime episodes is because I consume a lot of true crime stuff from podcasts to books to documentaries on YouTube, on telly, and they are always like an hour or plus long. And sometimes you need that true crime fix or you want that true crime fix without the commitment of it taking you a few days or weeks to get to the bottom of a case, hence this little thing that I do here. We're on the road to 5k subscribers as well, so if true crime is your thing, let me know by hitting that cheeky little button and making my day as well. Anyway, housekeeping is done. All of the corners have been sorted. Let's get into this week's video. Today, I am taking a trip overseas to Springfield in the United States of America to tell you about a crime that is as famous as it is unbelievable, as it is bizarre as well. It was this week in 1983, 38 years ago, that a 28-year-old mum of three drove to an emergency room saying that her and her kids had been shot in an attempted carjacking. She very, very quickly became the prime suspect. When one of her children died, Diane Downs found herself in prison for their murder. Welcome to the anniversary. It was on the night of May 19th, 1983, when Diane Downs burst into an emergency room saying that her and her three kids had been the victims of an attempted carjacking. This is a story that she told to suspicious officers when she was interviewed. She decided to take her kids sightseeing. Danny, who was four, Cheryl, who was seven, and Christy, who were nine, fell asleep in the back of the car, and she decided to drive down a side road instead of the main road on the way home because she liked taking the untrodden path or whatever. She saw a hitchhiker, a man who she described having straggly hair and a beard, and she pulled over to help him out and to give him a lift. Very quickly, he pulled out a gun and he threatened to take her car. Her exact words that she said to the officers were, you've got to be kidding me, before he pushed her aside and he began randomly shooting at her kids in the back of the car. Somehow, she managed to distract him and she pretended to throw the car keys so that he would go looking for them in the dirt on the side of this dusty road. She got shot in the left arm in the confuffle, but she managed to get away and drive her kids to the hospital where, on arrival, her daughter, Cheryl Seven, was pronounced dead. Danny received life-changing injuries where a gunshot wound in his back actually left him paralyzed for the rest of his life. And Christy, only nine at the time, suffered a stroke. Now, you can only imagine, you can't imagine, you have no idea, I say this all the time, how you're gonna act or you would act if something happened to you or your family. And grief is subjective. But when doing the research for this case, in watching the interviews that Diane gave, and there are loads of them because she was definitely in the center of the media eye, she just seems a very, very bit off. Not a little bit off, this one is off. For the record, Diane denies causing any of her kids harm. She denies the murder that she's been convicted of, the attempted murder of her two other children, and she is stuck to this very day by her hijacker, hitch, hiker, gun, thief, car theft story. But from the jump, staff at the hospital and the detectives were super suspicious. When she was there, while her kids were fighting for her life and the doctors were operating, she rang her lover for a chat or something on the phone. Investigators say that her behavior was really strange, that she was super flat, that she had no tears. And the thing about Diane that I've noticed, and I will put some clips of interviews that I've seen in here that you can see, is that she is so disconnected. When she's speaking about the harm that has come to her very children. She smiles, she smirks, she talks a lot about herself and her childhood, which yes, grief is subjective, of course, but like... This man shot my daughter. My first reaction was to snap back to my childhood. Well, I don't feel very lucky. I couldn't tie my damn shoes for about two months. 
It is very painful. It is still painful. Christy woke up, and as I say, she may be the only one to get me out of this. Would I have brought her to the hospital? Wouldn't she be the one that I would make sure is dead? It's just so uncomfortable to watch, and even though the police weren't having it straight up from the jump, it took them nine months to arrest Diane in this crime. And before they managed to do so, she gave so many TV interviews. And if there's one thing that I found when doing the research for all the cases that I cover on here, is that the people who are not innocent, they'll be injecting themselves into the public media eye scrutiny storm. A lot of the times, family want to grieve in private, they're distrusting of the media, they take the advice of the police, you know, to not say too much. But when people might be guilty, they're giving interviews to their local news, to the national news, to Tom, Dick, Harry, Samson, Delilah, and Ife as well. There's a reenactment where she is walking a news reporter or someone through what happened that night when one of her children were killed and the other two just sustained horrific injuries and she is given year 11 GCSE acting, honey. I'm gonna put it in here for you. I'm throwing the keys, okay? I'm throwing the keys. Simulating, yeah. Yes, I go like that. I got in the car, jumped in, put the keys in. I just hit my cast. Started the car and left. The car door shut itself. <laughs> it's like, come on, Diane. You are actually giggling like a giggling man and you think that no one's going to be suspicious of you. Even if we don't know how we would react to these things happen in our lives, I'm not sure that it's going to be chatting and reenacting such a horrific moment with glee in my heart. She clearly loved the limelight and she wanted people to know who she was, but also that reenactment, that interview, set police off in honing in on Diane as their suspect. If you notice, she hit her cast on the car and she says that hurt as much as and the police believed that she was going to say almost as much as when I shot myself. And even though at that time uh, there was no evidence that she had done that, it just gave him the hunch, it gave him the hunger to start pursuing her as a suspect. Her story just wasn't adding up. What she said happened just didn't match with the evidence that the police were finding and her attitude wasn't helping either. She didn't tell the police that she owned a gun that she bought not long before the shootings and they found 22 caliber bullet casings at the crime scene but they never found the murder weapon though. Witnesses who saw her driving to the hospital after the shootings stated that she was driving at five miles an hour which to me is maybe the most damning thing in this case because you can't tell me that you're going to be driving like an old lady when your kids are dying in the back. You can't tell me that you're not going to be gunning it down the highway, motorway, whatever one anyone wants to call it but she was driving at five miles an hour. One witness said they were concerned because they rolled up next to her and she didn't ask for any help she didn't flag them down she was just chugging along chugging along like a little little old lady and the police said that there were all kinds of red flags that went as they took their statement that what she was saying just wasn't making any sense why would a mother sightsee when it's dark out why would a mom that has three sleeping children in the car stop for a stranger why is she wounded in the arm when the other when the kids are shot fatally and seriously injured the police say that they knew that she was lying from the off they just needed to prove it the physical evidence and her story as well just weren't twinning in the way things should. There was no blood spatter on the driver's side of the car where she says that the attacker, hijacker, shot her. There was no gunpowder residue on the driver's door or on the interior door panel. And a break in the case finally came when investigators discovered Diane's secret diaries and they told of her obsession with a married man who didn't want her kids around. Now, everyone calls him Nick, full name Robert Knickerbocker, and he's the guy that she called at the hospital and he said that Diane had stalked him, she seemed willing to kill his wife and that she just wanted him for herself. But Nick Robert Knickerbocker was not down with the kids, he didn't want any children and that's where the police believe that the motive for Diane's crimes came from. And Diane was arrested in February of 1984. At the trial, Diane was pregnant. She was known for being promiscuous, which is not my favourite word at all and I just think maybe the coverage in this case hasn't aged well but this is what she said about being pregnant anyway. You can't replace children but you can replace the effect that they give you. And it was a fear in the case that she got herself pregnant in order to incur some sympathy from the jury. And in that strange media appearance, 
she said that she got pregnant because she misses Christy and she misses Danny who had been taken away from her because obviously she's in jail and she missed Cheryl so much and that she's never going to see her in the flesh and although you can't replace children you can replace the feelings that they give you by having more of them okay uh, prosecutors argued that she shot her children to be free of them so that she can continue her affair with good old Nick over there. Most of the case though relied on the star witness for the prosecution who was the surviving daughter Christy Downs. At the time of the shooting it's believed that Danny was sleeping and of course Cheryl didn't make it but Christy who had lost her ability to speak because of the stroke that she had suffered was recovering and she gave witness testimony for the prosecution in her mum's trial. After months of physical and mental therapy Christy was finally able to take the stand and testify and tell all about what happened to her that horrible night. District Attorney Fred Hughey asked Christy if she remembered who shot her and she simply replied my mum. She said that her mum shot her, her brother and her sister and then shot herself in the arm while they were parked at the side of a road. Diane Downs was convicted on all charges in June of 1984 and she was sentenced to life in prison plus 50 years and she was diagnosed with narcissistic, histrionic and antisocial personality disorders. In 1987 she escaped from prison and she was on the run for a little bit but she was recaptured and her two surviving children eventually went to go and live with the lead prosecutor on the case for Fred Hughie, him and his wife adopted them a couple of years after the trial and her fourth child um, who she named Amy Elizabeth, the one that she was pregnant with while on trial, was taken away from her 10 days before she was sentenced and she was adopted out and her name was changed as well. Diane Downs is currently serving her sentence in prison and her next parole hearing is scheduled for this year. And there you have it, our 10 minutes are up and hopefully I have tantalised you enough to have a look into the case of Diane Downs and the crimes that she is convicted of. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments, I'm going to be back next week with a brand new true crime story for you guys. Thank you for watching and um, yeah all the research links and stuff are in the description and I'll see you later.